grant fulfills all of its obligations, that we do what we said we're going to do, that we uh, uh, present our results, publish them as, as we're supposed to. One of the things the National Science Foundation requires is for everybody that generates data now, this is taxpayer money that's funding us, right? We're getting the money from the government. Um, that data has to be made available for other people to use as well. So one of my responsibilities as the principal investigator is to make sure that all of our data eventually becomes available to other people. And we do that by setting up an online database and uh, making our publications freely available. So basically, I'm the contact person for NSF. What that also means is that I get to um, help organize, organize the project. Um, what I would tell you about a project like LTDR, though, it really is a group effort. And so even though I can say I'm the principal investigator in the name, um, I don't take credit for the things we do. Um, it's very much a group effort. And we have a, we're really fortunate that we have a really collaborative group here. There are some places where a single person or a couple people have very strong personalities and tend to drive the program. And we have a history. I'm the fifth or sixth principal investigator, so we turn them over regularly. And I'm looking forward to stepping down <laughs> and having somebody else do this too. Um, and the advantage of that is that when no one person it, it, it appears to run the program, it really becomes a group effort. And everybody has input. So that's kind of one of the nice things about the Kanza LTR is we're a very collaborative group. So that, that's what I do. Um, everybody knows about LTR as a long-term ecological research program funded by the National Science Foundation. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk to you about weather and climate. And so this is a really big day because we have some weather, which is good. Um, and, and I'm going to not talk initially about things that are unique to, to Kanza Prairie or the Flint Hills. I want to give you a kind of a big picture view of weather and climate first. And we'll talk about maybe some local issues. And then I'll try to bring it back to what we measure what, you know, in Kanza and why it's important. And the first thing I point out is that there's a difference between weather and climate. Um, weather is what's happening now, immediately outside in our vicinity. So it's cloudy, the relative humidity is high, we have a particular temperature, and we'll have a high and low temperature today. Um, it's likely to be raining most of the day, we may get snow tonight. That's, that's the weather. It, it, it's, it's short term, it's, it's what's happening now. Climate is, is very different, and the climate represents long-term trends and averages. And so when we talk about, we, and of course, climate change is, is, in the, is in the news today. And a lot of times people will say, well, it's, you know, climate change is, you know, it's not real for me because right now I'm in the middle of a really cold snap or something like that. Climate is a lot different than local conditions. So I want to talk about where climate comes from. Because I, when I, so when I teach my ecology class, I teach a general ecology class to undergraduates. And we start by talking about climate. And sometimes that seems really weird to them because this is a, supposed to be a class about organisms, you know. But it turns out that I, I would argue climate is one of the most important variables in determining where organisms are distributed and what they do. So I want to start with kind of understanding global climate. Okay, so I, I tell them the reason I, I, I say that climate is really important is if you think about it, you know, climate affects the, the geographic distribution of plants and animals, you know, birds, insects, trees, why they occur, where they occur. So if we look at species distributions around the globe, there, there, is, there, is, there is an evolutionary history aspect of this, right? Some organisms are distributed the way they are because of where they evolve. But a lot of where they're distributed now has to do with the climate conditions that allow them to be. So if you want to understand why organisms are distributed the way they are, we have to look at climate. And then as an ecologist, I'm interested in things like understanding plant productivity. You know, what is the average productivity of a forest or a desert or a grassland? And you can directly relate that to climate. Rainfall and temperature determine a lot of that. And the same thing's true of processes like decomposition. And, and stop me at any time to, um, to ask questions. I, I'm, I'm interested in soils, and I'll show you in a little bit a map of the soils of the world, and it, it will match a map of the distribution of all the major biomes, which will map a distribution of climates. And so, you know, climate is actually what determines the soil patterns of soil development, the kinds of soils we have in different places. And then from, from a very human perspective, climate influences the health of human beings. And when we think about things like climate change, that's actually one of the 
It's a fairly big concern right now in a lot of countries. They're looking at this from a security and human health perspective. Um, there, there are direct effects of climate when we have things like droughts or heat waves, for example, being associated with the heat waves in Europe recently being associated with high rates of mortality. But there are also indirect effects on things like diseases, which are strongly influenced by climate or food availability. The reason I put war in here, there was actually a really interesting uh, paper in Nature um, four years ago now. But they looked at the outbreak of civil wars in northern, in sub-Saharan Africa, basically. And what they found out was there was a very strong correlation between ENSO events, what the, the El Nino Southern Oscillation weather events in Africa, how that influenced water and food availability, and the outbreaks of these civil conflicts. And they found that you could correlate about, about, about a quarter of the civil conflicts in Africa were correlated with changes in weather patterns and how that influenced resources. And then that, that in turn influences human interactions. So climate's important. And so we all know organisms respond to climate. What I think sometimes people forget, though, is that the climate on our planet is actually very strongly influenced by living organisms, too. And that, that's kind of a cool thing to think about. You know, of course, plants and animals are dependent on water availability, the rain, and temperature. But these are some of the ways that organisms, in turn, alter the climate. So it turns out the amount of sunlight that's absorbed is, is really strongly dependent on how reflective the surface is. So surfaces like ice or sand reflect a lot of sunlight back into, into, the, into space. And dark surfaces absorb more sunlight. And plants alter that. So the distribution of plants influences the, we call that the albedo, but it's the reflectivity of the planet. Okay. So a tropical forest absorbs a lot of different light than a bare, bare soil would be, and cutting down forests can change the climate by influencing the albedo of that area. So that, that's kind of cool to think about. And then, of course, we're, we're going to talk about some greenhouse gases in, in a minute. But a lot of these gases that are important in determining the climate of our planet come from living organisms. So one of the really important ones is CO2, and obviously that's a byproduct of respiration. It's taken up in photosynthesis. The oxygen we have in our atmosphere, in fact, is directly is, is, a, is a product of, of photosynthesis. Um, plants. So transpiration is the process where plants take up water from the soil. They move it through their vascular system, through, their, through the pipes that are the, in part of the plant's vascular system, and they release it back to the atmosphere. And that's a major pathway for water getting back from the soil to the atmosphere. It's one of the reasons, again, thinking about cutting down a tropical forest, you can alter the climate because you alter the amount of water going back into the atmosphere to form clouds and provide rain. So plants influence these regional hydrologic or water cycles. And then one, one other thing that I, I didn't realize for a while was that you know raindrops, so it's raining outside today, um, raindrops typically form around small particles that are called cloud condensation nuclei. They're tiny particles that allow water to con start to condense, and then those drops get bigger until they gradually get heavy enough to fall. Okay? Um, a lot of the particles that act as, as the nuclei for forming raindrops are actually bits of organic matter. Either parts of microbial cells or, or microbial debris or little bits of organic matter from decomposition. So the weather, the weather, the climate on our planet would be much different if we didn't have the organisms that we have because it's a strong interaction. What about the burn here last week? Do you think maybe that helps the rain? Oh, good, so good question. So burn does put a lot of particulate material in the air and that does influence, certainly, some of those particles could act as cloud condensation with that. The only thing I would say about that, though, is because of wind patterns, the, the particles that we put up in the air here aren't necessarily the same ones that are involved in raindrop formation locally. But, but, they, but likely they are influencing raindrop formation. <coughs> and there are lots of other sources of particles in the atmosphere, too. Now, and all of those play a role. That's a good question. Is this, um, does this have something to do with this process of cloud seeding? Yeah, it's the same sort of idea. The, the idea with cloud seeding is that you add particles of often uh, with these uh, silver nitrate, I think has been used in the past. But it's the same basic idea. You put small particles of material in the atmosphere that would act as nuclei for the formation of raindrops. And 
the same thing happens naturally. Okay, so what, and this is just from, this is from, when I teach this in class, I tell the students basically, what I want to do is I want to I'll tell you about global climate patterns. You know, why is it wet in the tropics? Why, why, you know where most of the major deserts of the world occur? They're in a band at around 40 degrees north and south on the planet. Why is that? It has to do with these global circulation patterns. So we'll talk about that, um, and that's kind of what this is. And we'll talk a little bit about what the greenhouse effect is too, because I think that's, that's important to understand, because that's, a, that's something about the climate that's in the news a lot these days. So one, one thing to realize is that the, the climate patterns on the planet are really a result of solar inputs. It's how the sun heats the planet in a very uneven way, and that sets up circulation patterns. And those, those patterns have been modified by, by land masses and by oceans. And so and this helps understand the greenhouse effect, too. The Earth is an open system with respect to energy inputs. We get energy inputs from the sun continuously, right? And we have to have energy outputs back from the planet. And those two things have to balance one another if the planet stays at constant temperature. Okay? If it didn't, if we just got energy inputs and there was no energy outputs, well, the Earth now would be a very unpleasant place. So you have to have the same amount of energy going back and out from the planet that's coming in, and we'll talk about that. It has to be, so the way, and the way it's balanced is we have, we have sunlight coming in, which is a lot of, of well, it's, it's, it's very high energy solar radiation. It's light and ultraviolet, okay, and a little bit of, of near infrared. And the planet absorbs all that, and, and in, the, in the process, it heats up. Okay? And then any object that's hot radiates infrared radiation back away from it. In this case, the planet radiates that back into space, and that's what determines our global temperature. Now, the thing is, the sun is, doesn't heat the Earth evenly because it's like a ball. We have, we have sunlight that's coming in on particular parts of the planet that heat it up more than other parts. And what happens is that sets up circulation patterns in the atmosphere to redistribute that heat. Okay, and that's what drives global weather patterns. So you think about the, the Earth is kind of like a giant heat engine. Parts of it are hotter than others. Where it's hot, you have air that's rising. In other places, you have air that's falling. And that sets up all the global circulation patterns. <coughs> OK, so this is an overview of what the greenhouse effect is. You think about we have, we have sunlight coming in. We just say we have 100 units of sunlight, just arbitrary. We, have, we don't worry, have to worry about whether it's watts or whatever. Just 100 units coming in. Where does it all go? Okay, well, it turns out about a third of it or so. Well, that's the average average interest. I mean, we don't have to worry about the units. Um, only about half of that actually reaches the Earth's surface. Okay, a large chunk of it, about 31 percent, is reflected. Okay, that, and that's remember that term albedo. Albedo means reflected energy. It can be reflected from the Earth's surface, or a lot of it's reflected by clouds in the atmosphere. And so clouds play a really important role. So about 31% about is reflected, and some of it's absorbed in the atmosphere as it, as it comes through the atmosphere, too. So only about half of that actually um, is intercepted by the Earth's surface, warms the Earth. Now this is an important part of the greenhouse effect. The sunlight that's coming in includes um, short wavelength energy, like visible light, okay, or ultraviolet. That visible light, especially, passes through the atmosphere. It doesn't, it doesn't get absorbed by gases in the atmosphere. So short waves, visible light, the atmosphere is pretty transparent. So that light energy gets to the surface of the planet. That warms the planet up. It just like um, you know, shining a very intense light on a, on a black ball, on a bowling ball, you'd end up warming up that side of the bowling ball. 